Well, hello, hi, I'm good. So um, before we start, um, I just want um, to first of all um, hear your intake about um, nurturing the future of generation of um, African innovators. What does it mean to you and what have you done to support this cause? Hello, hi. Um, so my name is Shwakat Ali, um, technical director and founder of Robotech Labs. A huge shout out to Sahara Sparks for this great opportunity and my team sitting behind there, awesome guys. Um, so I think in regards to nurturing the future of um, Africa's innovators, there has been a problem that we've identified and that actually begins from the grassroots and that's education. Um, I believe from my experience and from the people I have been working with, there's, a, there's actually a, a need for practicality in the current education system and with our current ICT structure or curriculum, it, it is actually a missing element of practicality. There is no application what people are learning in today's school curriculum. Having identified that as a problem, we actually took initiative ourselves to visit all the private and public schools and ident identify individuals who had innovative ideas or projects or concepts in mind that we found could be potentially scalable. And with that, we found out that there's a lot of hidden, unique talent individuals that needed a voice, needed a platform to stand out. Um, with that, we actually approached the government and unfortunately we were not actually even able to get support as such because it was still um, an idea and still is unfortunately. But we took the other way around. Mm -hmm. And we went to the school and said, if you think that you are an individual that just needs the right guidance, right expertise and right resources, you can just come by down to our office and get started. We started with only one student from one public school. Now we have more than 130 kids coming to our office every week. It's, it gets packed. I mean, we actually actually have, thank you so much. I mean, it means a lot. And I believe our biggest um, achievement was an event that we had uh, earlier this June called Tech Fest, where we brought in almost 1,400 public school uh, kids from all over Dar es Salaam to showcase their products. In fact, um, these kids were all over Dar es Salaam on the outskirts in the public schools and we actually brought them to city center in particular. Um, they had ideas and we thought they could actually be scalable. And out of the nine projects presented during the Tech Fest event, we had five of them actually get funded. And all these kids are only high school kids. You're looking at, looking at kids who are in Form 2, Form 3, and Form 4 getting around a seed funding for their ideas. And as we speak, Vodacom Foundation is actually funding one of the projects as we speak now to the next scale. So for us, this has been, I think, um, a stepping stone in making the impact that we need for the African people. Okay, thank you very much. And you talked about um, the school curriculum, how they haven't changed. Um, we're gonna pause on that and get to that back later. Nancy, come to you. Tell us something about what you do with um, Bongo 5 Media and how you have done it to help supporting the cause. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so I'm, I'm going to actually represent Jenga Hub today. And essentially, uh, what Jenga Hub is, is just a maker space and a learning lab where children and young people uh, have access to technology and com computational technologies, essentially, that will allow them to become digitally literate. So what we uh, aspire to do is to allow them to create, to thrive, um, to really th apply design thinking in um, the everyday learning um, through play, but to be able to, to really engage inventively with technology and to be able to, to mold the next generation of change makers and innovators um, in Africa out of Tanzania. We were founded to serve children um, from not so well-to-do backgrounds, and as we have grown now, we realize that the market, even f for children who have access to these technologies, are not really using them up to par. And so we've, we've sort of looked at that as an opportunity, and we're present as a club in a lot of pr private and public schools, and our space remains open to children from all backgrounds to just rock out with technology, um, destroy, build it up again, and just be able to learn how to get comfortable with it, to use it, um, to interact with it, and to build something meaningful. Um, and also, until recently, we've started training a lot of teachers to see ways in which they can also bring this design thinking and computational thinking um, skills back into the classroom, ways in which they can also um, uh, apply technology to help them with their work, the teaching job, how they can be able to bring research skills into the classroom, and just ways in which even them alleviate the workload um, using technology. 
Great. Um, I think one of the things that you both have in common is that you're working with young people and they are, they are from 15 year olds, yes? 15 year olds to very. As well as five. As young as five, and when you're talking about the, the Sahara this year, we're talking about um, the fourth industrial revolution. And when young people um, think about, when want to get into discussion about the fourth industrial revolution, they usually think about robots take over because the word is so big. They think they don't have a say in it. Um, maybe I'll start with you. Um, how would you demystify um, the fourth industrial revolution to young people um, to make them see that it's, it's actually not as complex as it is and ways that they can actually engage into the conversation? Wow, tough question. <laughs> no, actually, this, this is a really good question. Um, honestly speaking, it is very scary. I, I only suggest one thing to my students and my colleagues I work with in the office as well. You just go crazy. You know, there's this thing, we also you just go YOLO all the time, you only live once and just do it. <clears throat> but I really think that the problem we're facing is not, um, how am I say this correctly, is I don't think there's, there's no such thing as fear. It's always about taking a leap of faith. I mean, as an engineer, Thomas Edison, before he made the light bulb, he did a thousand experiments and then finally found the light bulb. But that's the whole point, the, the learning experience is important. And I don't know, from my experience, I think we are actually scared to actually take the leap of faith. I've seen people who have been trying to do something, but it doesn't happen once, it doesn't happen twice, and they just lose hope. I mean, that's, that's not the end of the world, I mean, correct? So you gotta give it a try and see what happens. But that, the other thing that I think is another problem is lack of expertise. You have young kids who have really good ideas with a lot of potential and scalability, but the expertise that we, that we pose in front of them is not enough. You have an idea that's based on AI, for example, that can be scaled to a greater height, and not, not, in, not, not in a national scale, but an international scale, but we do not have necessary infrastructure to support that. And as a result, I, I, I personally feel very like dumbfounded if I can't do anything about it. So we, what we have, what we actually do is ensure that there's a continuous learning process, iteration, innovation, and creativity happening all over and on, on and on again until to a point where we feel that success can be attained. And eventually, we have this outreach program that we actually speak to other people and bring people back here. But that is, there's a small fear, but hey, you just live once, man. Just go for it. Break a few stuff, make a few stuff. That's how life is, right? So give it a try. Merci. So I think um, technology has been very interesting, and I think the question really we should all be thinking about is the fact that um, it's seeped into our daily lives so heavily in the past sort of um, decade or so. Um, the question is really not for us to fear it, the question is really to think about um, ways in which it can add value to our existing life, because it's, it's happening anyway. And that's what I usually tell a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of worry in which where there's access to content for children, um, most of it often comes unfiltered, but really the way in which we wanna look at it and empower our children is the fact that this thing is happening anyway, it's happening at a pace that if you don't keep up, you will be left behind, and unfortunately <coughs> being left behind is not a cost that we can afford to bear at the moment. We want to just look at it in a way that you empower the child, um, you allow them to use it in a safe, interact uh, with, for example, the internet in a very safe way, um, to be able to learn about all those filters, uh, to be able to, to just look at a way in which they can be able to take charge instead of just um, playing catch up with technology. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I think another thing I, I did not mention is the fear of technology taking over our current jobs. I remember um, yesterday, I think Malimo had mentioned that um, losing one job will open another, a few other jobs. I think the way we should look at um, technology in a, in, in a disruptive manner is by, I think, the, the means of aiding. We do not use technology to, to replace people, rather aid the peop people in the current processes to isn't tasks done. That's the way you should look at things, I believe. Okay. And going back to the point of when you talked about um, the school curriculum not being changed, I have a question on that. So how can we reach the goal of like integrating AI um, while the school's curriculum are still like stagnant, I can say. I'm not sure if that's the right word to use, but we, 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 are, not, we, we are not yet exposed. For example, you said you're working with people from Form 2. Do you really think in schools we have that set of curriculum that can help us um, achieving this goal? Unfortunately not. I mean, honestly speaking, I have I have been given the opportunity to see what the current school, public school curriculum is offering, ICT in particular, but it's not aiding with what's happening in the world outside. The problem is we are really outdated in our current system today. I mean, look at, look at the people outside as early as primary school in private schools abroad. People are learning programming as early as grade two or grade three. 
we do not have that system in place to actually nurture people with current ICT skills and knowledge in primary level as well. In fact, the basic skills that we've been taught, unfortunately, is basically Microsoft, Microsoft Office, Excel, making notes. No one's teaching basic app development, basic um, coding or programming, which can be done with very simple and interactive toys and tools. This is something that I think the government really needs to look into currently because if we did not invest in this at an earlier stage, the future looks very gloomy to all of us, honestly speaking. And I, f I fear for that because, I mean, I have been through the system as well. And I, I mean, working with kids, I, I can understand what they're going through and I really want to bring back as much as I can for them. The sooner the better. So we, we, have, we have had a discussion with the mayor of Dar es Salaam and hopefully we'll be having a meeting with the chancellors to pitch the idea of having a revised curriculum that's actually in par with current technology trends in the world today. Great, um, and Nancy, um, following up what he just said, um, what do you think now we need to prepare? And I, I'm talking about this from all angles, the private sectors and the government and the parents who usually we forget to mention them. They are the people who are with these kids. What do you think we need to prepare to push this agenda forward? So you raise a very important point because um, when looking at this issue, it has to be sort of quite wholesome. Um, for example, a, a part of what we really promote through the hub is learning through families. So a, lot of, a great amount of households at the moment easily have a smartphone, even though um, it might not be a very advanced one, but th there is a prevalence of having smartphones within every household possibly in the country at the moment. And right now, it's just ways in which um, we can also empower the parent to look at that as a tool um, for learning even outside of the school systems, um, to encourage learning beyond the, the eight to three or eight to five uh, curriculums that the children have at school. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, obviously, uh, I, I really support what Shao Katali was saying about government. There is an opportunity, certainly, um, for government to partner with folks in the private sector and also adopt best practices uh, from, from countries who have adopted this. I think uh, our brothers in Rwanda are doing a great job. I think n right next door in Kenya have also, um, uh, you know, the, the, the prevalence of technology within the classrooms have have uh, really grown in the past few years. And it's because of that investment from government, but partnering with private sector. The investment is costly, um, and it's players like, unfortunately, the government and ourselves, but there's only so much we can do out here without the support of really that big wave. We can't, we, we really can't get that momentum that we really require now. Um, time is of the essence, obviously. We can't keep waiting. Um, the world is already quite a far ahead, but the great thing about technology, it allows an opportunity to sort of leapfrog, right? Um, it's very interesting how you can just give a child a piece of technology without with very, very minimal or no instructions at all, and you would see a kid, to, a kid interacting in a fashion that is, that is quite surprising. So I think there is certainly an opportunity to look at ways in which you can get these tools and um, have the teachers trained. Uh, have parents uh, within that ecosystem also empowered um, and hopefully invest in the, in the future of our children in a really meaningful way. Okay. In the spirit of um, having everyone involved, um, especially um, for the parent side, um, the, the, the social standards, most people I think would uh, either agree with me or disagree with me, but um, most parents, it's either um, technology in general is doing good for you or bad. They are never in between. It's either technology is bad for you, do not use social medias, because that's the only um, information that the parents get. So how can, um, how can digitalization be used um, um, to add Im impact and to produce um, progressive generation? <laughs> So very quickly, I think um, if, you, if, you look at, <laughs> if you even look at the trends of the world, there are people who are becoming billionaires off of social media alone, right? Um, and so this is why I feel like That's it's really, you, you, can't run <laughs> you cannot run away from these things that are there now. The best we can do is look at ways in which we can impact it in a positive way um, while we serve community, become the change makers that we want and of course make those billions off of it. Uh, I think if we're able to invest with, with that kind of knowledge with children from a very young age, then you, you sort of shy away from having a situation where it's just of face value, but it's, it's more meaningful, it's more deep impact in that sense. Okay. Shelter? 
<laughs> Ali is easy to remember. Um, I, actually speaking, I think Nancy has a very good point. I think, honestly, in life you have a choice. You have the right way or the wrong way. I've, I was going the wrong way and then come back the right way out of fun. Um, but I really think the, the appropriate use and guidance of technology is needed. I mean, that starts with families and teachers. If education is coming from school, then teachers have to be well, well groomed on how the technology is actually being used in the right way. If you come back to the homes, homes, you have your smartphones, you have your tablets, just correct guidance and I think, not just correct guidance is needed. But I don't see anything that has to be formalized or has to be emphasized that it has to be this way. It's either this way or there's no way. I mean, that's not an option. In life, you always have an option. You can either use technology in, in advantage to you or to take you to the wrong way. I mean, that's just a choice you have to make, so it doesn't so really matter. Just add on to that, though. I, I do feel like there is an opportunity um, to, s to sort of continue to promote internet safety among children. I think that it can, it can go south pretty easily um, without the, the required guidance and sort of uh, protection mechanisms in place as far as children are concerned. And so, uh, so I think it's, it's certainly an, an area of opportunity from us players, from government, from parents, um, from teachers, from just everyone that uh, is surrounded by, uh, well, children uh, are surrounded by it. There certainly is an opportunity to continue to just work towards protecting them and ensuring that they, they have the necessary knowledge, but also those, those mechanisms are in place to protect our children, even while they're engaging with the internet and technology. Thank you. Do, do you have something to add on? No? Just go crazy, man. <laughs> Just go crazy, it's always the answer. Um, so I would open up to the audience. Um, if anyone has questions to these lovely people. I was curious on why you guys do what you do. I wanted to know why you're so passionate about nurturing you know, the, the young individuals. Why make, what makes you tick? What makes you tick? First. Ladies first, please. <laughs> when it's convenient. Yes. Um, so I think for me, the journey really started, um, was it in two, 20, 2005? I can't, I can't really remember the date. It's time to be corrected on the date, but um, there was an 80% fail rate with the primary schools in Tanzania where children uh, of class seven could not read and write to the power of a standard three-year-old. Um, and I began thinking, and at that point I had just written a book um, and I was going to a lot of public schools, sort of engaging, setting up book clubs, um, and sort of offering my time to teach literature to children. Um, and very quickly I realized there needed to be an answer beyond that, what I was doing, something more sustainable and something more big impact. And very quickly technology came out on top. Um, and I started doing a lot of research and looking at other best practices, countries who had done it, uh, folks in our country who had already set up hubs and how they were addressing the issue of children and young people. Um, and very quickly it was very obvious that um, when people were talking about technology then, they were not really talking about children and technology. Um, and it struck me odd because if we're talking from a sustainability standpoint, these seeds needed to be planted very quickly, very early. Um, and so that's just how my journey started. Um, we started quite small. We just started uh, to borrow office spaces on weekends that had access to the internet and you know, no one was there anyway. And so we just started inviting children to come over and just learn about computers, learn about technology and interact in that way. And we've just grown from there. Um, so it essentially just started from that need um, for children to just do better uh, through technology. Yeah. Hi, Chris. So honestly speaking, what ticks me is my bad habit. I think you have been with me for quite some time, and you know my bad habit is just breaking stuff again and again. I've never, never, I never call myself an innovator or an entrepreneur. I'm a breaker by career. I just break stuff that come in my way, and out of that, I make something out of it. So a childhood habit, a childhood bad habit became um, a passion. A passion developed a curiosity to understand how things work by breaking things, and that curiosity led into a career. So a bad habit to a career eventually today. I realized that um, the current, like I said, the current problem that I found that my, well, my friends and colleagues I've been working with have been facing is they could never apply their knowledge that was actually taught to them theoretically in classroom. So, for example, my sister comes back home one fine day and she's talking about Pascal's law and physics and I hope everyone remembers physics, by the way, just reminding you. And she was explaining that this is how it works. I'm like, can you apply it outside the, the notebook? She says, no. It's like, what if I told you you can make a water rocket using the same principles? And she, she just scratches her head, she's like, hey, that's a good idea. 
So using the same basic science principles to actually show application of what you're learning in classroom was my main focus. And as usual, breaking and making stuff is what I actually tell my parents and my students that I'll be very honest, I'm not promoting your child to learn something. I'm teaching your child how to break stuff. So if he ends up coming to your house with a screwdriver opening his TV or his fridge, do not be mad, support him or her because that's how they learn. And we've had plenty of complaints. Every, every parent, parent complains to us, my child has done this thing because of you, as a pause, but thank you. Which is like the best part. So I think the bad habit is actually being influenced on the youth today and we've seen the outcome. I mean, as we speak today, we've had a lot of youth build really good projects and always say, Mr. Ali taught us how to break stuff. And I, I, always, I always feel bad about it, but I, I, yeah, I'm happy, man. Thank you. Yes, we'll do this. Uh, my name is Mr. Kintu. Uh, I have a very simple question, but uh, for me it's a problem. I wonder if you would mind to help me out of that. Uh, my question is, do you have, uh, in your activity, uh, do you have any connection about uh, natural resource, what we have here, and the technology, what you are talking about? Because I think this is very important for us, especially in our country, to deal with our natural resources. For example, tourists, or cash crop, or nowadays we are also dealing with the natural medicine. We try to put it into modern way. So I think I don't know if you connect this uh, innovation uh, with uh, our natural resources, with uh, our young brothers, uh, our young children, or not. I don't know this. Did you understand the question? Yeah, I think I did. Um, so, <laughs> I think, for example, for us, uh, among the things that we do with the children and young people uh, are projects around that we call Designathon. Essentially, these are um, maker days, or we promote maker education. And what we want to do is for the children to think about um, challenges or problems within our context here in Tanzania and see ways in which they can add value um, or help or address these challenges um, from a design thinking and technology standpoint. And so we very much promote uh, for them to look at their everyday lives um, or everyday spaces within our country and see ways in which they can add value. It's everything, it's, the themes range from everything in um, waste or food or the circular economy or um, water, um, our natural resources, ways in which they can look at these things from a, and take ownership from them and address the challenges that are in these spheres. Um, through the things that they are learning with us. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, I remember um, uh, there was a, a group of girls, um, uh, Caroline actually introduced me to a bunch of students who were committed for the first global robotics in, in Washington, D.C. And the problem statement was based upon, um, the concept was called H2O on water. So the students had to design a robot that could actually go to a, a reservoir of water and the, water, and, the, and the river basically have two kinds of power particles, so soft balls. There'll be um, a water particle and a contaminant particle. So the robot's function would be to actually pick up the balls um, in, the, in the robot, sort the, them based on the color. If it's a water particle on one side, if it's a contaminant on the other side, and then deposit them in, in the lab, if it's, a, if it's a contaminant, and water particle back to the reservoir. So it's very important that we actually theme technology on these areas to actually show that how you can, one can use simple basic technology with a little bit of coding knowledge and robotics interest to actually address this kind of area. So yes, everything now is actually themed towards areas of interest. And if I'm answering your question correctly, yeah, I guess, awesome, so. Thank you, um, I think we'll take last question or two more. Okay, two more questions. Um, we, we didn't have any ladies. We don't have any ladies in the room. <laughs> Great, thank you. That lady over there, please. Uh, hello, my name is Catherine, I'm from Iringa, and I work with rural women and young girls. Um, congratulations, both of you, for what you do. Um, I would like to learn from your activities, do you have any activities that's nurturing children and young people in rural communities? And if you have, what are they? And if you, you don't have them, um, what is your take on this for the rural communities? Thank you. 
Yeah, sorry, I, I can add on that because it was okay. Um, when I was young, I was the first time my dad bought a, a TV set. He brought a, a technician and installed it and stuff. The first day, I deleted every channel in that uh, TV set. That's good. I did that for like five times. You know, I'm glad that you talked about letting them break stuff, but I used to do that uh, at the expense of my dad's money and stuff. But after five times, I was now an expert. I could configure our, uh, our home TV set, and I could, I could even make money. My brother became my manager. Like so you paid the bills back, right? Yeah. We paid back the bills of damage, right, at home? Mm -hmm. OK, good, awesome. Good. Yeah, my brother became my manager. Like He would find people with new television sets, and I would go configure them. I would make money like 500 Tanzanian shillings. That was too much for a kid, right? But problem is, I was in the rural uh, areas. So what are you going to do to, to enable those kids in the rural areas? But you're doing great stuff. So since you mentioned rural areas, let me explain what our plan is as an individual. Um, we have been working very closely with Vodacom and actually having um, a tour space, a maker space, and uh, maker space tour. tour. Um, recently, there was a young scientist week that took place in Dar es Salaam at the Judas Nehru Convention Center. A lot of students had amazing projects that we found really good just using basic resources that they found outside their house in the backyard or in the, in the dumpster. Um, we just identified that these schools did not have the correct infrastructure or the lacked infrastructure, and we are in place to actually start a tour of Tanzania, not in Dar es Salaam, a Tanzanian tour to visit all these schools that came for this event and try establishing maker spaces for them in their schools with up-to-date relevant resources for um, the better future. That's our current focus right now. Um, so, so you can clap, by the way, just saying. Right. <laughs> we stopped halfway, I don't know why, though. <laughs> so what we are doing to address uh, that particular challenge, because our biggest bottleneck is our physical space, but then to be able to go beyond that. And so what we do is that we sponsor teachers from across the country. Uh, we equip them with the knowledge and we give them basic tools to just go back um, to, the, to the areas that they come from to be able to set up these mini spaces and they can be able to train children after school. So they can set up this, these clubs within the schools that they teach or, out, or in an after school setting. And so we've sponsored so far about 350 teachers and we're continuing to work with private sector to see ways in which we can continue to empower them with these tech tools that can, they can be able to just go um, and set up these clubs for children and they can interact with these kids um, and empower them with our knowledge and tools. Did you also respond to the ladies' questions? Was I it response? Yeah, so, so I, yeah, I hope you answered the same thing. question, yeah. Is it? Yes. So, awesome. Okay, great. Um, how we are with time? Can we? Uh, yeah, it's okay, we can uh, respond to her and then we can take this last question, and okay. then maybe we can wrap up. Great. So, okay. the lady? I really like your character, the way you are saying, um, just be crazy or be bizarre, be different. But uh, saying it is one thing, and in real, um, bringing it to life is a lot more different thing. Like, often we face a lot of challenges when we are different, when uh, we try to do something new, just because it's not what's usually been done. So I just want to get inspired from you and hear if you faced such challenges because of being uh, different and always breaking stuff instead of making them and, you know, thinking bizarre ideas so that I can use it and use my different mentality to achieve stuff. You sound crazy already like me, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I, I don't think I only have a story to tell, to be very honest. I think it's a very emotional topic because I know what it's, it's, what it's like being someone who likes thinking outside the box, but you're always being told there's a box you have to be inside of, but the truth is there's no box. So I, I think Nancy, Nancy and I will share the same background, but I think Nancy will, have, will tell her story as well because I, I think Nancy also has a story to tell too. So I'll be polite, again, let ladies <laughs> start first, and then I'll say mine. Cool? So I think I think uh, children are naturally born curious, inquisitive. I think they, they just have this uh, passion for creating stuff. And that's oftentimes why uh, the bulk of the children that I see and I've interacted with break things down first before they put them back together. It's just a spirit um, that we want to keep nurturing rather than take away because oftentimes uh, with our social contexts, 
uh, when you see a child breaking something, your immediate response would be to either take that thing away or you know, scold them or um, just sort of kill that vibe altogether. Um, because it is sort of naturally within us as human beings to create, to be inquisitive um, and to innovate, um, essentially all you need to do is just keep nurturing it, keep nurturing folks like him when he was young, um, to not take it away, but just allow for it. Um, if you cannot spare a TV, then you make an arrangement to, to just have some stuff that you are willing to let go of uh, and see how, where that journey really will take um, you and that child all together. She's so polite, man. It's so bad, no? <laughs> no, I, I'm honestly speaking, I remember when I was, I mean, just during my, my childhood, I remember applying for my, my, my bachelor's in mechatronics and robotics engineering, and I remember I was questioned by my counselor very bluntly that what you're thinking has no scope. I'm look, I told him, I'm, I'm looking at 10 years down the line, not tomorrow. And I remember coming back here, I did not have a job, and I was told, you cannot, you, you, there's no scope for it yourself as a career. I'm like, if there's no scope, you bring the scope. I'm like, what's wrong with doing that? And eventually, uh, people I met today, like Ralph, for example. Ralph is a crazy guy like me. He looks very innocent, but he's not being honest as well. And we just, I just actually, when we came today, we were just talking about our, we actually came at 9 o'clock in the morning, and we went to Kayako together to look at all the um, secondhand items that were found from, you no, know, people break stuff on TVs. We were both very happy working on the road. We were just talking about our channel. Like, you know what, we, we know what it's like being told things that you cannot do it. That's always going to be there. And you, you will talk about it, and it's your choice. You want to stand, stand in, the, in that box that you've been told you can't do it, and you will never do it. Or you say, okay, no problem, and just go crazy like me. Make an inverter, blow someone's house up, no chat though. I'm going to do that eventually. And explore. I mean, I've always told my students who finish their A-levels as well that I've, I don't do career counseling. I'm a very bad advisor, to be very honest, so I'm going to give you bad advice right now. Uh, I told them, if you finish your A-levels, don't go to university directly. And they're like, my mom's gonna kill me, so that'll kill you. It's okay, go for it. I always advise them that before you pursue a career and you have options, pursue them first. See that the options that are available to you. If you wanna do five, six things together, take a year gap, explore them. There are so many things that are happening now that weren't happening before, and there's so many things that are gonna happen eventually that aren't happening now. So the only thing that I ask them is, are you ready for change? Your parents are, can be supportive, cannot be supportive, but it's up to you on how you see yourself doing what you love most. So I am generally passionately curious. I'm a breaker, unfortunately, but it's pretty cool too. I'm a maker, and Nancy says the most polite way, be humble. So go crazy in the most humble way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much One for that. One more question? <laughs> OK. Just the last one. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sadiq. I'm with uh, Ishangazi in, uh, Index Labs, Tanzania. First of all, thank you very much for uh, having my question because I think it would have been a crime me attending Sahara Sparks and not asking a question to the panelists. Uh, thank you very much for your inspiration. Uh, all of you guys, you're doing uh, very good things and motivating the youths. So one of the challenges that we're facing in Tanzania is teenage pregnancies. So how do you see digital revolution, fourth, Africa's fourth uh, industrial revolution, uh, solving this problem? That is my question. I know when you, ask, you like asking challenging questions, this is my question to you. Uh, Nancy, uh, especially because uh, the way you explained what you're doing, I think that this is much more uh, concerning you, but Shaukat, you can also pitch in. <laughs> so Thank you. You, 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 you're very much right, sir, that um, it is quite the challenge that we have now in our societies where we are, as a society, we're, una we're unable to protect our children enough and now we're facing the consequences of it. Um, one of the fascinating things that I think uh, children really get from, from being a part of these clubs or having a, sort of a, a space where they can interact with other children and have peer-to-peer -peer -peer learning is that they sort of, a, a new, a whole new world opens up for them. They're able to, A, learn about uh, their rights, but also learn and ask questions and ways in which they can also learn to protect themselves. Um, I'll give you a very quick example. So one of the projects that we are working on in the hub right now is sort of like a, a child protection app that the children came up with. Um, so it's very much on paper right now, but it just gives you a sense of 
the way the children are thinking and ways in which they are sort of exploring this problem, but then to be able to look at it from a solution standpoint gives them the ability to sort of take ownership of the problem, learn ways in which they can address it, but also sort of be strong enough to stand up for themselves. I think this is a challenge that cuts across, that just goes, be, I mean, it's, it's from the government level to all the way to the fam family level, right? Where all of us have a role to play to see to it that we're protecting our children enough to see them realize their dreams and not be um, sort of derailed on the way. Technology absolutely, I feel, presents a very unique opportunity because it doesn't just give um, these kids a sense of belonging, but it also allows them to research, to come up with ideas, to, to just give them an outlet altogether. It's very challenging, of course, for folks who are within the rural setting where the cost is still very high for data. Um, there's electricity problems where you can't, I, I mean, I know this, there's a solar answer to these technology tools, but it's not quite there yet. Um, but I do very much believe that if we are able to empower our children, not just with technology, but empower the boys and the girls with, this, with information, with knowing their rights, with seeing ways in which they can be able to protect themselves, a, either with a technology solution or just protecting each other otherwise and standing up for themselves in that way, I think we, we're definitely going to make headway. Um, th that is just one example that we're working on as a hub together, but I think it will be able to touch children across the country at some point in time. But there's also, again, an opportunity for teachers to also um, stand up and do a better job to protect these kids um, from the parents. But again, I mean, you can't run away from such a problem and not say that definitely government has a role to play and technology too, I guess. Yes, also to respond to the question, um, I, I want to talk to, um, to a very low level, like the family level. Um, most of the time, because of culture, um, the parents usually, uh, we, they discuss all these issues with their children, but they discuss in such a way that it's very closed. We are, they do not tell the truth. And I think the first step is to tell the truth, because if you don't do that, then a child will be curious to start now going, let's say, to the internet and finding those truths. And most of the time, they do not know how to do that. So they find a lot of junks in the internet. So they learn from them. So I think that that's can be the starting level. And also, um, in the technological part, we can have now, um, there are lots of people I've seen, I've known working on like the digital solution, how um, young women can uh, safely ask questions, um, this pressing question that they're afraid or they're shy to ask either their parents, to ask um, other people, they can go ahead and start those conversation and actually learn from experts rather than just finding junks um, online. So I think um, that would be my intake and Yes. Um. If I can just add on, because I know so oftentimes we talk about uh, the abuse of the children, but then we forget about these victims and what they have to sort of do to piece their lives back together. And again, I feel like technology would be a, a really interesting uh, avenue to look at ways in which I know most of it, by law, they're not allowed back in school, unfortunately. Um, but then ways in which they can access curriculums online, for example, they can be able to be homeschooled, they can be able to learn new skills, even graphic design, and then set up their own sort of side hustle while they are put piecing their life back together. So I think technology can, can address the lives of the victims even after the abuse has happened, but also can help prevent the abuse before it happens. Well, thank you very much. Um, and that is it from us. Thank you very much for that lovely discussion. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for them, please. Thank you so much, Winnie, for moderating.